So uh, did, but did anyone see the uh, talk last night by Dr. Carter? Yes. Um, so I won't be that good. Oh, <laughs> just, yeah. Um, so, but I have a lot of details. I normally don't read, but I was gonna do a little bit of reading if that's okay. Um, so every decade, astronomers in the United States collectively construct a series of recommendations to NASA and the National Science Foundation uh, on their top priority telescopes and satellites to build. These recommendations are a window in some, into some of the most interesting astronomy of the last several decades. There are also stories. The main characters are not people, but rather telescopes. Each story starts with scientists guessing what sort of discoveries they will make in the coming decades. As, teles as the telescope is developed, built, and then used, our scientific understanding grows and evolves. How scientists end up, end up using the telescope, usually decades after the initial recommendation, also evolves. Some of these recommendations have been built and used in discoveries in much the way that scientists anticipated. Some have been built, but made discoveries that were only hinted at in the initial recommendations. Some were recommended, but then eventually abandoned. Telescopes are large scientific instruments that require significant resources to build. They also can require a decade or two to build. If the telescope will be in orbit, that is a satellite, it can take longer. The birth and growth of a telescope as the scientific world changes around it makes for a fascinating history. Today, I wanna to present two interesting recommendations that were in fact built, Kepler and Spitzer. Kepler. Sometimes telescopes are designed and built for a very specific mission. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, the goal is to answer one question, then shut down. There are few missions in astronomy more important than knowing whether or not humanity is alone in the universe. It is hard to explain our level of ignorance here. It is possible humanity is the only intelligent life in our galaxy. It is also possible th that our galaxy is filled with civilizations similar to ours. As they say, the answer is out there. We just don't know what the answer is. Small attempts have been made to look for other life. They've been noble, but it is hard to know how to look. Our failure is to find anything is not surprising. A simple step forward then is to figure out how many planets similar to Earth exist in our galaxy. That was the single mission of the Kepler Space Telescope. That, uh, uh, it was launched in 2009 and operated in, uh, till 2018. The story of Kepler is one of both failure and spectacular success. The, su the success is straightforward. It helped detect more planets than all other telescopes combined. The failure, it was proposed and launched to answer how many Earth-sized planets exist at Earth-like temperatures around Sun-like stars. It never answered that question. That tension between success and failure makes for an odd story. To understand the success and failure, we need to go back to where, what we knew about planets in the 1980s and early 1990s. No planets outside our solar system had been discovered. Planets are typically too small and dim to observe directly. There were several ideas floating around to sidestep this problem. The first proposal in 1992 to NASA for Kepler requested funding for a concept study. The, proposed, the proposal described a satellite that would take images of 6,000 stars similar to the sun for at least a year. The goal was to observe a planet passing in front of a star. If this happens, the planet blocks a small part of the starlight, dimming the star briefly. An example of such an observation taken with the actual Kepler Space Telescope in the 2010s was shown, is shown in the upper left. The star, in this case, Kepler 62, dims for a few hours. The dimming is quite small, much less than 1%. Most planets do not pass in front of their parent stars. That is, planets orbit around their parent star with a tilt that can be anything. The examples on the right show four possible circular orbits of a planet around a star. When the circular orbit is seen near the edge on, like the top example, the planet will pass in front of the star. When the circular orbit is tilted at any other angle, however, the planet will never pass in front of the parent star. The Kepler Space Telescope would overcome this problem by looking at thousands of stars, hoping that some planet orbits, orbits happened to be tilted favorably. The 1992 proposal was rejected. The reviewers actually liked the approach of observing thousands of stars, 
They were not convinced, however, that the images would all be precise enough. Look again at the example of Kepler-62 in the upper left. The dip in that graph represents a change of 0.04%. If the measurements had, been, had more noise, the dots would be more scattered and the dip would be basically invisible. Scientists eventually estimated that the scatter in the camera would have to be about 20 parts per million. That is, if they were measuring a star with a brightness one, the device would measure between 1.00002 and 0.99998. If the sun and earth were viewed at the ideal angle from far away, an earth eclipse would create a dip of about 84 parts per million. The 22 parts per million represented a hard requirement to meet and the reviewers of the 92 proposal were not convinced it could be accomplished. The scientists proposed again in 94. Some important changes were made, including the technology for the camera. The scientists had done sufficient experiments with the then new CCD technology to show that it was able to achieve a sensitivity of 10 parts per million. The stars themselves have variation, which adds to the camera noise. The total noise they claimed to achieve was 22 parts per million. The proposal was still rejected. The principal reason given was cost. NASA required that these proposals have a low total cost, less than $150 million. The reviewers thought the design was similar enough to the recently launched Hubble Space Telescope, which had cost roughly 10 times the $150 million limit. The next opportunity to propose came uh, for, uh, for the mission came in 96. The telescope was redesigned in several ways to lower the cost. First, the telescope would be put in orbit around the sun instead of the Earth. The new orbit would be similar to the path the Earth travels around the sun, but the satellite would trail behind the Earth. The principal advantage of this orbit is that the telescope was more stable. Significantly less fuel is required to keep the telescope pointing in a steady direction. The telescope would, would need a especially steady pointing to achieve the low noise. So by choosing the new orbit, the telescope would not need as much fuel for steady pointing that would lead to significant savings. With the improved camera technology, the scientists were able to propose observing 80,000 stars, again, with the hope that some would have planet orbits with good tilts. They also estimated the total cost in several ways. The proposal was still rejected. The reviewers were convinced that the measurements of 80,000 stars could not be done in an automatic fashion. This was a time well before the era of big data. Computers were significantly slower. Regular quick analysis of 80,000 stars had not been done before. The next opportunity to propose came in 98. Before that proposal, the scientists set up a camera on a telescope to automatically monitor 6,000 stars. The atmosphere introduced tremendous noise into the measurements, making any new planet detect detections impossible. However, their goal was to show that making measurements automatically on thousands of stars was possible. <clears throat> the proposal in 98 was largely the same as the one in 96, just with more evidence to support, the pro to, uh, to support that the project could work. It was still rejected. The reviewers stated that they were unconvinced that the whole system would work at the needed sensitivity. In essence, no individual part seemed impossible, but the whole project could be too complicated. The next opportunity came in 2000. In preparation, the scientists built a full simulation of the system. That meant creating a structure that would create the jitter typically present, present for satellites in space, a realistic range of star brightnesses and spacing, a rotation orientation to simulate the effect of orbiting around the sun, and many other effects. The whole process took 14 months and had independent oversight. Even then, they simulated planets eclipsing their stars to estimate the size planets they would be able to detect. One result of the simulated eclipse is shown in the lower left here. The proposal was accepted. Although all the work to show the project would be sensitive enough was probably necessary, there was another reason the proposal was accepted. By 2000, there were 30 planets discovered outside our solar system. Those planets were all discovered using ground-based telescopes. They used a different technique, at the time, it was unclear what the best approach to finding planets would be. It was clear, however, that there were planets waiting to be discovered. The Kepler Space Telescope would be the 10th mission of the medium cost NASA Discovery class. It, of course, still needed to be built. That process took until 2009 when the satellite was launched. The final design for Kepler used the largest scientific camera uh, at the time. 
It had 95 million pixels arranged among 42 separate detectors. The camera was large enough that the detectors, which are flat, were placed on a curved surface to improve the focus. The camera during construction is shown to the upper left. The telescope would be run quite differently from typical astronomy missions. The telescope would not run a series of observations chosen by different scientists to answer different questions. Instead, the telescope would point the very large camera in a single direction and measure the light over and over and over again. The direction was chosen very carefully to balance several different priorities. First, scientists wanted to measure the light from stars that were as similar to our sun as possible. The two most important criteria were star temperature and size. Our sun's surface is about 6,000 Kelvin. The size for comparison purposes is best measured in units of the sun. That is the sun has a radius of one. There was a five-year campaign before launch to find 1,500,000 stars, which were the best match. The direction they settled on is shown in the images to the lower right. The, science, the scientists wanted to be careful to avoid the brightest stars since a bright star's light can ruin measurements of the other nearby stars. In total, about 150,000 stars would be measured on a regular basis. Unfortunately, data communication between the satellites and the Earth is precious. It would require too much time to send each image back to Earth. Instead, the data were selectively sent back. Only the pixels surrounding the specific 1,500,000 stars were considered. For most of the stars, their brightnesses was averaged over 30 minutes, then sent back to Earth. For a select 512 stars, their brightness was averaged every minute, then sent back to Earth. The idea here is to use 30 minute averages to figure out which stars had planetary eclipses, then select those stars for one minute averages so the eclipse could be measured in detail. Using one minute averages for everything would have been better, but that would have required dramatically more time for sending data back to Earth, which would have taken away time uh, from actually observing the stars. The mission was initially planned to require three years. An Earth-like planet in planet size, planet temperature, and parent star properties was a good, with a good tilt will eclipse its parent star once a year. Under ideal conditions, the eclipse would create a dip of 85 parts per million in the star's light. That requires, however, the aver averaging the star's light over several hours as the planet passes in front of the star. If the orbit is not perfectly edge on, the planet will spend less time in front of the star. That provides less time for averaging, which in turn makes the dip harder to measure. The goal was 20 parts per million when a planet would spend six and a half hours in front of the star. For planets that spend less time, all was not lost. Scientists could average together several different eclipses one eclipse per orbit. For a system similar to Earth, that means waiting a year between eclipses. That is what drove the requirement for a three-year mission. Only by averaging together several eclipses could Kepler make precise enough measurements to find planets that matched Earth in size, orbit, and parent star. Other systems, however, could be detected, could be detected more quickly. If an orbit is smaller and then shorter, the eclipses would be more dramatic and more often. Both effects make the detection easier. The first announcement from the Kepler team was of five new planets. All the discoveries fit the expectation of what would be easiest to detect early. Large planets that were close to their parent star. They were each around the size of Jupiter and orbited in about five days. As observations continued, more and more planet detections were announced. Unfortunately, a problem was also announced. The stars being observed were noisier than expected. As I mentioned previously, all stars have some variation in their light. Our sun has a variation of about 10 parts per million. The scientists assumed our sun was typical in the variation. It turns out our sun is more steady than average. Most stars that they were observing had a var variation of about 20 parts per million. When they added in the variation caused by the camera, the total variation was about 30 parts per million. In a sense, this bad news wasn't the fault of anyone except for the stars. <laughs> the solution was simple, although not cheap. The mission would have to continue longer than initially planned. Instead of three years, an extension of several more years would be necessary to average enough eclipses to detect Earth-sized planets in Earth-like orbits around Sun-like stars. In the meantime, other planets would be detected. As the years rolled by, smaller planets with longer orbits were announced. This image shows the planets detected through 2017. Each planet is represented as a dot. 
The yellow dots are planets discovered using Kepler. The dark blue dots are planets discovered using other telescopes before Kepler. And the pale blue dots are planets discovered using other telescopes after Kepler was launched. The higher the dot is, the larger the planet. Note that Jupiter, Neptune, and Earth are off to the right to give some reference. The farther the dot is to the right, the longer the planet orbit requires. Most important, the most important thing to notice here is that Kepler was discovering more planets than everything else combined. It was also discovering smaller planets. Kepler was able to discover smaller planets where other telescopes, mostly from the ground, were unable to discover them. It's worth remembering that before Kepler was launched, some scientists thought it possible Kepler would find nearly no planets. That would have happened if planets were rare. Planets are not rare. They are common. Kepler was a success because there were planets to discover and it found them by the thousands. By the end of its mission, it helped discover about 2,300 planets. This success is the most important turning point in the history of our mission to find out if humanity is alone. There are, other, there are planets out there. Based on the statistics of planetary tilts, the planets in our galaxy probably number in the 100 billion. That large number, however, counts all planets of all sizes and all orbits. The most common planet Kepler discovered has a size between Earth and Neptune. Earth is the largest rocky planet in our solar system and Neptune is an ice giant. This middle ground does not exist in our solar system, yet it is the most common in our galaxy. Odd. A better way to describe the newly discovered planets, however, is to say that there are no strong patterns. The planets have all sorts of characteristics, small planets, close planets, large planets. Um, this plot shows one example of this seeming randomness. Each line represents a different solar system where multiple planets were discovered. Each dot on a line represents a planet discovered by Kepler. The dot size represents the planet size. The dots on the left have short orbits, some less than a day. The dots on the right have longer orbits, some longer than 100 days. In our solar system, the four small planets closest are relatively close to the sun. The four largest planets are relatively far from the sun. This pattern does not appear to hold for the solar systems discovered by Kepler. Kepler also found a collection of crazy, hard to believe, hard to believe they exist planets. For example, Kepler 1520b orbits its star every 15.7 hours. The planet's estimated temperature is 2,200 Kelvin. The melting point of lead is 1,800 Kelvin. The planet is hot enough for rock to be a liquid or a gas. Although we do not have images of the planet, subtle hints from the Kepler data indicate the planet is evaporating away. That is, the star's light is so strong around the planet body made out of rock that the planet body, which is made out of rock, is evaporating. It then escapes into outer space, much like comets in our solar system. An artist's version of what this process might look like if we could zoom in is shown to the left. Kepler 47b is a planet that orbits two stars. Most such systems would probably be unstable, but in this case, the two stars are especially close and the planet is especially far away. The comparison to a somewhat famous science fiction movie is hard to avoid. The summary so far is that planets do not appear to be falling, following an obvious pattern. By late, 2020, by late 2012, Kepler was finishing the initial three-year mission based on the high noise created by stars, however, about three more years would be needed to meet the goal of measuring Earth-sized planets in Earth-like orbits around Sun-like stars. NASA granted and funded the extension. Um, in May of 2013, however, the Kepler Space Telescope had a catastrophic failure. The telescope uses four wheels to rotate the telescope in space. Two of the four are shown in this picture uh, of Kepler before it was launched. The reaction wheels are indicated with arrows. The steering is actually quite clever. Instead of using fuel, these wheels are rotated, which allows the rest of the telescope to rotate in the opposite direction. By having four different wheels tilted in different ways, the telescope can, ro can rotate in any direction. The problem was that two, uh, uh, that two reaction wheels had failed. Actually, the first wheel had failed in 2012, and the second wheel had failed in May of 2013, and that was the disaster for the telescope. With only two working reaction wheels, the telescope could no longer, was no longer able to rotate itself appropriately. The primary mission was at an end. 
That early end to Kepler meant the extra data needed to find Earth-sized planets in Earth-like orbits around Sun-like stars could not be completed. In that strict sense, the mission was a failure. By almost every other measure, however, it was a spectacular success. Fundamentally, it established that planets are common. That result gives us confidence that follow-up missions to look for planets will have something to look at. There was further work to be done using the Kepler satellite with fewer reaction wheels. However, I want to leave that story to move on to the next telescope. Spitzer. The Spitzer Space Telescope was a top recommendation in 1991 uh, to NASA. It was built and launched in 2003. At the time, the main science driving the project involved looking at other galaxies, some from the very early universe. A second area of science was looking at the was looking at the material that surrounds some stars and was thought to eventually form planets. 15 years later, Spitzer had become a planet machine. That is, it spent a large fraction of its time specifically measuring the light from planets around other stars. That this science was not envisioned when Spitzer was recommended. It was it was not envisioned when it was launched, but it was one of the top legacies of the satellite. The story is one of here is one of transformation. Spitzer is an infrared telescope. It covers the wavelength range from three to 160 microns. Infrared telescopes need to be especially cold. Spitzer achieves its cold temperature in three ways. First, it had a temperature that was a system that was basically poured liquid helium on key devices and allowed the evaporated helium to carry away the energy. This system was similar to previous telescopes. The helium system was, de was designed to last two and a half years. Because they planned for worst case scenarios, it actually ended up lasting five and a half years. Second, it had a shield that would absorb sunlight, allowing the scientific devices to remain cold. This system was the first of its kind. Last, it was placed in an orbit around the sun, not the Earth. More, more specifically, it was placed in an orbit very similar to Earth's, but trailing by several months. Spitzer was the first telescope launched into such an orbit. The reason for this orbit is that Earth actually produces a significant amount of infrared radiation. An infrared telescope, if it were in orbit around the Earth, would have to constantly avoid that light source. By placing Spitzer in this more distant orbit, Earth's infrared light could be largely avoided. By the end of the story, we will see that this choice ended up critical to how Spitzer was later used to observe planets. Spitzer had three instruments that could be used, two different cameras and a spectrometer. The two different cameras were for the shorter wavelength range and the longer wavelength range. The shorter wavelength range camera had a nice design where it was able to take four images simultaneously. Each image was used, uh, used a slightly different wavelength of light. When the helium ran out after five and a half years, most of the instruments were no longer useful. Without coolant, the instruments became warmer and as a result, useless. Part of the shorter wavelength camera, however, could still be used. It turned out that the shield was effective enough at keeping the camera cool that the two shortest wavelengths of light where the heat was least important still worked well. This result was not in the initial plan. It was hoped for and it came out of a good design. The main reason to build Spitzer as an infrared satellite was to avoid the Earth's atmosphere, which both absorbs and produces infrared light. There was a specific science that there was specific science astronomers expected to be able to do when they recommended it in 91. That science was mostly about looking at very distant galaxies. However, I want to concentrate this story on a different on a different aspect of Spitzer. Astronomers also expected to make some progress in studying how planets form around stars in pretty specific, but in pretty specific ways. During star formation, gas starts out spread over a very large volume, typically hundreds of thousands of times the larger than our solar system. Gravity only pulls matter together, so it tends to bring the matter towards the cloud center. During that process, however, most of the gas first forms a disk of material. This process is actually very common across different, very different sized objects for vaguely similar reasons. That's why we see rings around Saturn and spiral galaxies. After forming a disk, the gas continues towards the central star. Some of the material enters the star, but some is instead pushed along the north or south pole of the star. Lastly, some of the disk material will stay around the star and form planets that then orbit the star. Spitzer was expected to observe the disks around these newly forming stars. It was hoped that changes to the disk could be observed that would suggest planets forming. This was expected to be an indirect evidence, however. Astronomers were not predicting 
that Spitzer could be used to actually measure fully formed planets. That is exactly what happened, however. Remember that this was roughly the same time as some ground-based telescopes uh, and Kepler were discovering planets indirectly by their dip in starlight. Spitzer observes inf infrared light. Stars are typically dimmer in infrared light because of their temperatures are in the thousands. Planets, on the other hand, are typically brighter in infrared light because their temperatures are in the hundreds. Stars are still brighter than planets in infrared light, but only by roughly 100,000. In 2005, Spitzer was used for observations no one expected when it was launched. Spitzer was able to observe the extra infrared light coming from planets. To understand how this was possible, it is worth spending some time going through how it works in detail. When a planet passes in front of its parent star and blocks the starlight from reaching Earth, the planet's orbit also does the opposite. That is, the planet will later pass behind the star and the light from the planet will be blocked from reaching Earth. In most cases, the planet light is so weak that this event doesn't matter. It is typically not observable. In 2005, however, it was announced that Spitzer was used to ob observe it for two stars and their planets. That is, a dip of light was observed when a planet passed behind the parent star. These observations, the two dips, are shown in the graph to the lower right. Uh, although all that was imaged was a dot of light, the fact that the dot got dimmer at just the right time expected for a planet passing behind the star was rock solid evidence that some of the light was coming from the planet. That is, by measuring the second dip, this one or yeah, this one, um, by measuring this second dip, astronomers measured the light coming from the planet. This measurement is really just the beginning of the fun. By measuring things like the length of the dip, the depth of the dip, and other properties, astronomers can estimate the temperature of the planet. The temperature of this first planet detected in this way was roughly 1,100 Kelvin. There is a major qualification to this result, however. Understanding the qualification starts by looking closely at the light measured from the star and the planet again. The two plots here represent the same data. The top one is a zoomed out vertical scale and the bottom one is zoomed in vertical scale. The top one allows us to see both dips completely. The bottom one by zooming in shows us something else. Notice that there is a waviness to the data between the dips. That is, the light increases a little bit just before the second dip. Remember, second dip is planet passing behind the star. This waviness is caused by the planet. That is, this planet is close enough to the star that the same part of the planet always faces the star. A similar effect occurs between the Earth and the Moon. That is, the Moon is close enough to the Earth that the same side of the Moon has been forced to always face us. For this planet, that means the side, the side always faces the star is always in daylight. It gets hotter than the opposite side, the nighttime side of the planet. When the planet is just about to pass behind the star, the day side is facing us. At, at other points in the planet's orbit, the planet's night side is facing us. The waviness in the light is caused by this shift between the planet's day side and night side facing us. That's pretty nice. Just like on Earth, there's a difference between the typical daylight temperatures and nighttime temperatures. The 1,100 Kelvin is an average. The typical daytime temperature is 1,200 Kelvin. The nighttime temperature is 1,000 Kelvin. Gets even better. Just as predicted, when the planet's day side is nearly facing us, the planet passes behind the star. If this was all perfectly in sync, we would expect that the waviness would have peaked in the middle of the second dip, if the second dip didn't block our observations. By careful mathematical analysis, however, that does not appear to be true. That there is a slight shift. Out of 360 degrees around the planet, the shift is about 16 degrees. So the peak daylight doesn't exactly line up with the peak temperature. The most reasonable explanation for this shift is that there is wind on the planet that shifts the heat slightly. The wind speeds necessary for this shift are faster than about 10 kilometers per second. It's faster than the speed of sound on Earth, very fast. So astronomers managed to measure light from another planet estimate its daytime and nighttime temperature, and infer a very rough wind speed. 
all without an actual image of the planet. Nice. Similar measurements have been done on about a dozen other planet star systems. I'll skip over descriptions of systems here, however, for time. All this science depends on being able to measure the brightness very well. When Spitzer was first designed and used, such precision was not possible. As exoplanet discoveries were made, however, scientists and engineers worked on, two way, on new ways to use the telescope. There were two principal changes made. Both were done during the period after the helium ran out. That is, this was in part possible because they had the time on the telescope to experiment with high risk, high reward techniques. Yeah. So why don't we see more of a variation when the uh, planet is just off the right or left limb? It would seem that you'd be able to see more of the, uh, of the planet without the star essentially interfering. So it seems like there should you be mean, some. I'm not, I'm not following what you mean by right or left limb. So in the dotted version of the star that's behind it, once it rotates just a little bit further to the left, it will be outside the uh, outside the. Star Sorry, wait a second. Which are you looking at? This no, no, side or this? The side? upper left. The oh, upper left. Okay. Yeah. So you've got that dotted, what's behind the star. Yeah. But it will soon come out, and it would seem like there should be some bump that corresponds to the to the hotter Trend. cold side of the planet coming out. Oh, you mean like? Waves. Well, I mean, there is a transit, like these dots sure, represent then, it, well, these dots represent like it passing out, but you feel like there should be more, something besides just a transition from here so to here? Are you saying those dips correspond to when it is off the limb of the, of the star? Or I'm saying like when it's off, like when it's passing, when it's coming out from behind, like you can see half the planet. Yeah. That's vaguely like this dot oh, of that dot. Okay. So that, that is what we're saying. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, and that was what the one minute uh, observations were. Yeah. Oh, well, no, I mean, this is Spitzer, not right. Kepler. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, so one change involved a heater to the telescope. Although most of the telescope was designed to stay cool, a battery on the telescope needed to stay within a certain temperature range. Left alone, the battery wouldn't operate well enough. Engineers added a heater to the battery to improve the performance. Although they engineered the heater to keep heat isolated to the battery as well as they could, some heat creeps to other parts of the telescope. More specifically, when the heater would turn on roughly every 40 minutes, a support structure of the telescope would also warm up. The support structure would then bend slightly, pushing the telescope to point in a slightly different direction. The effect on the telescope was small, but exoplanet observations require better than 1% precision. So small effects like this support structure bending mattered. Engineers experimented with different cycles for the heater, eventually finding that one uh, that involved half the heat output. The result reduced the support structure bending by about half. The second change also involved pointing the telescope precisely. As with all telescopes, there are wobbles in the telescope where engineers are never able to determine the cause. One typical solution is to use an extra camera the extra camera is pointed at a bright star. As a random wobble moves the telescope, the extra camera measures the shift and recenters the whole telescope. Such a camera was already on Spitzer, but had only been used for the spectrometer, not the camera. After the helium ran out, engineers and scientists designed a method of using this extra camera to keep the telescope centered for all the exoplanet observations, even though these observations didn't use the spectrometer. Both changes, the heater and the extra camera, improved the centering. As a result, the measured brightness was also made more stable. As a comparison, uh, look at the difference between the first, uh, from the first light from an exoplanet detected with Spitzer and uh, the transit from one of TRAPPIST-1's planets detected later. So the upper left versus lower right. Spitzer was imagined as an infrared satellite that could observe disks around stars and distant galaxies. One of its greatest legacies, however, has been observations of planets around other stars. Unlike almost all other research on exoplanets, Spitzer has been able to measure the actual light from the planets. This has allowed measurements of planets' temperatures and even the weather. This surprise was due to a few influences. First, scientists chose a relatively unexplored area to investigate, infrared light from space. 
It was unexplored enough that there were new fundamental discoveries to be made. Second, we learned more about exoplanets between when Spitzer was designed and when it was used. Sometimes we're lucky and that just happens. Lastly, Spitzer was well designed. The choice for passive cooling and an orbit around the sun was uh, not the earth was allowed Spitzer to be used for much longer than if it had depended on helium coolant entirely. Scient scientists and engineers were also willing to take risks. They used a lot of the telescope's observing time to learn how to change its operation and make more precise observations. Those risks paid off and now we know more about planets. I hesitate to draw any broad conclusions about the development of new telescopes. Each telescope is imagined, designed, built, and used somewhat differently. Those differences are, at least as much as the people involved, responsible for the science we discover. Every design difference has a story behind it, a reason it wasn't done before, and a reason it was tried for the first time. Some of these telescopes worked, such as the ones I've discussed. Some did not, which make up other stories. I'll stop now, take any more questions that you have. Thanks for your time. Curious, how much did they spend on that simulation to get that contract? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never saw the budget for that. I mean, it's probably a lot more than, than so. I mean, it helped guarantee that it worked, yeah. but like, I gotta believe it must have been a lot. I mean, after four rejections, spending 14 months doing that seems insane to me. I would have walked away. <laughs> um, and it shows, I think, a remarkable stick to itness yeah. to like really believe that this was possible. What was your involvement with the uh, Kepler? So um, Kepler, not at all. Spitzer funded my PhD thesis. Um, I mentioned the, the short wavelength camera that took four images simultaneously. Um, I was heavily involved in a survey of the Milky Way galaxy using that camera. Um, so I helped design uh, a novel way to exploit that camera to survey a much larger region than anyone had thought we could do previous. But that was not, it wasn't planets, it was doing a survey of the galaxy. So it was interesting stuff, but not what I wanted to talk about today. I got a question. On, on the Kepler, you know, you, you indicated that they found a very few, like, I don't know, it's not as many Earth-like planets. But is that, is that like a real result, or is that because they have trouble detecting Earth-like planets? That. They never had the sensitivity. Okay. That, like, if their non-detection doesn't mean anything besides their reaction wheels died. Like, they weren't, they needed to operate for six years, they stopped after about four. So if some statistical genius takes the data they got and they like nope. go backwards and say, well, you know, we nope. can see this sort of like, but that was the closer one. So uh, um, anyone who know, does I'm that sure. is secretly inserting a model of how star how planets form. Uh, I got you. Right? Like when Earth form, like Earth in our solar system is one astronomical unit from the sun. How like if we knew how common Earth-like planets are, say. 0.3 astronomical units from the sun, that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about how common Earth planet like planets are <clears throat> further away, unless you make some assumption. And you can secretly do that and try to hide it, or you can do it explicitly, but no one knows how solar systems are formed. Like the lesson we learn, like if there's a lesson from Kepler, aside from the high risk work, it's there does not appear to be a pattern. Um, and that what we the story that was published in you know standard textbooks that rocky planets form close gas giants and ice giants form far away was apparently far too simplistic and the true story is some other story so so there's still a lot of hope basically like, you got the big the big disc collapsing to form planets but how they end up where they end up is kind of like it's it appears that they move like that where they form and where they end up staying long-term can be different spots. Um, and why they move is like what directs their motion is and what like consistent rules there are. It's a little hard to say. 
it's all probably gravity. I mean, like things run into each other or like ricochet off each other. So in some sense, it's all gravity, but like how that gravity plays out is unclear. I'm still very optimistic. Like earth sized planets appear to be common. Um, and that doesn't mean they're made out of the same stuff as earth. It doesn't mean that there's the same distance. It doesn't mean they're the same temperature, but it seems like the temperature range, like the appropriate distances are wide enough that like there's probably, if I were a betting person, I think there's probably a lot of planets that are Earth-ish in size, temperature, uh, and parent star. We just didn't get to measure them. So it's how many planets have been discovered now since? Um, 10 years since he's so I don't know what the latest number is. I doubt. So it's a little, you have to catch people what you mean by planet because with Kepler, they would see like two dips and call it a candidate, but not a planet until they saw three dips. Um, and so sometimes you'll see people like lump in the maybes into the yeses and come up with a number like 5,000. Um, I don't think the number, is, if it's Bigger than 3,000, I don't think it's much bigger than 3,000. Kepler blew everyone out of the water in terms of numbers. It was way more productive, way more productive than any operation on the ground. And the follow-up satellite is called TESS. And its goal was not to discover a lot of planets. It has a fundamentally different goal, um, which doesn't involve measuring thousands, discovering thousands of planets. So is uh, Kepler data actually driving uh, the Webb scope and its investigation of planets and did it drive uh, uh, Spitzer? Um, so I don't think Spitzer, look, I don't know how many Kepler planets uh, Spitzer looked at. That's a really good question. And um, I'm not actually sure how many, what the targets are for James Webb. I thought Tess, the, the follow-up, I thought that was guiding the targets for James Webb, but it wouldn't surprise me if I'm wrong about that too. Um, so, I mean, the requirements for James Webb are, I mean, you need, you need an eclipse. Uh, and then the goal is to see starlight that passes through the atmosphere and uh, some of the light gets selectively absorbed. And that is thought as a way to like measure the atmosphere like what is what the atmospheres are composed of. Um, but that measurement is super delicate. Like you need just the right balance of planet size, star size, distance from us. And I don't know what, like how definite the targets are for that. Yeah. Because it would seem like you only had two pools to, to draw from. Well, no, it's a so pool and then a ground based pool. Oh, well, yeah. So yeah. I mean, the ground based pools, there's a lot of different people working. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't mention at all the radial velocity method that is used. That's complementary. also depends on a similar style of inclination, um, but uh, is sensitive to different sorts of planets. Um, but uh, but I, I could imagine that producing some good candidates. My, my next question is, I think it was Elliot, was his first name, it was Elliot Spitzer. Why, was oh. he, why, why did he have an instrument named after him? Um, so he was an early astronomer. I don't know what nationality. Um, so, but he was influential in uh, analyzing gas between stars, um, and which is a lot of, produces a lot of infrared light. And this was an infrared telescope. So that's why they named it after him. Is he still alive? Oh, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I don't know anything about him. That's why I asked. I assume he's passed away. When did uh, he, so was he in the same cohort as Hubble or did he come after Hubble? Oh, I think he's after Hubble. I thought he did his work in like the 50s and 60s. Okay, thank you. That's, that's I think. Um, although like, <laughs> I don't, yeah. If someone has a quick birth and death date, so that'd be helpful. Like Van Allen then. Yeah. Well, the size of the star determines the size of the planets. Um, so 
we don't know why the planets that form end up forming. Like, and I don't think you should trust anyone who claims they do know. Like, um, I mean, it's, I have never heard anyone convincingly claim that there is a definite pattern. So planet formation is not my specialty. So it could be that like, so the latest results do indicate, but it could be the other way around. Like, for example, the somewhat larger, hotter or stars tend to be hotter, more ultraviolet light, sometimes dramatically more ultraviolet light. And I could imagine that evaporating away the gas before it has a chance to form planets. Although, I mean, nature has surprised me more than once in my life. So it could be that that process doesn't matter and maybe hotter, larger stars do form larger planets. Um, hard to say. Other questions? I just, just a comment. I just find it fascinating how none of those star systems seem to be similar at all in their arrangement of planets. That's just such a remarkable uh, outcome. It's humbling, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah, that one is the, maybe the second one's the top down sort of. You mean that like looks a little like our solar system? Yeah, but then the two bigger planets are spinning around in 10 days or so. And it's kind of so. Yeah. You know, yeah. You need more data. <laughs> <laughs> Just need to launch another Kepler. Well, yeah, I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, what would you rather do? Launch a better satellite or build some more stuff up? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it. It is a it is a tragedy that those reaction wheels failed and that we didn't just keep collecting more and more and more. But I am so glad that those scientists kept proposing after all those rejections. Uh, and it was always some new reason. What's the latest proposals look like? You know, I mean, those proposal like proposals are typically not shared uh, because. Like, they have like a committee that just looks at it. Right. And but they're, they're, I mean, they're it's, in it, that's in secret. You're like, <laughs> in part because, like, if someone proposes, like they were in 96, they got rejected, they don't want someone else coming up with like their best ideas and then adding one fix to it and submitting it. So, like, if your proposal failed, you get to keep that proposal for if you want to go round three or four or five or whatever. But on the other hand, then there would be more competition for the, the better solution, like the you know, individual research might get kind of quickly chapped. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is a balance. I mean, you may know you make a good point. No, I mean, it's uh, like, you know, that's like how the Nobel Prize kind of works, right? I mean, like, you know. It's not like they're patents or something. You know? that, like, <laughs> yeah, that's you know, true. Like or somebody tell Linus Pauling thought that, uh, you know, DNA was kind of like, Watson, but he had, he had like everything, he had the, the stuff on the inside, on the outside or something. Yeah. He, he, you know, he had the right idea, but he kind of broke the rules of chemical bonding just to kind of like, I know it's a, <laughs> I know it's a helix, I get it there, dang it. You know? Yeah. But, hmm. but anyways, they, you know, there were people with different ideas that they, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that, that balance between like, it, you could you could imagine it going a different way where people are hesitant to propose because they don't want their ideas shared until they're fully ready. Yeah. Uh, instead of being a little aggressive about submitting proposals. Yeah. Um, I know I've had friends that like, they plan on submitting it like three times and they submit it the first time and they want to get really good comments. Sure. And like, that's actually their goal is to get really good comments, knowing that like, they're not going to be in the top 10% to get accepted, but like, It'll be in the top 50% and then top 25 and then top 10. Um, but that sort of dynamic might not happen. It's hard to say. Okay, so this costs like 150 million bucks or something? Yeah, I mean, it's a little, 
So I'm thinking if somebody yeah, else costs more than what their budget. Well, and just, it depends what year you use for the budget, like for inflation adjusted. This guy I, I know that's in the news that like <laughs> owns this electric car company and he had 44 billion that he threw away on Twitter. Like, I mean, just think if you did just said, like, hey, let's get some. Oh my God. I mean, yeah. think about that. $40 billion. I mean, how yeah. Much, that would that would buy you like you know maybe three hundred Kepler or something. You know? Well, you go to the Walmart and buy it. You know, it's <laughs> but there's something I think fundamentally different about like just wanting the answer. That's true. Right? Like the goal here wasn't to like get in the news or to get rich or whatever. Like the goal is we want to know the answer, and once we know the answer, like everyone knows it, right? Like our planet's common, yes or no. We now have the answer. And you can't hide it from anyone. Sure. And there's, a, I think, a certain different people are attracted to like doing different things in their life. Yep. Some people want these sorts of answers where like it's easily and automatically shared. Uh, some people want to do something else. <laughs> oh, I think it's great. So Spitzer was Lyman Spitzer Jr. Oh, it's not Elliot. No, I Oh, Elliot Spitzer. Wait, that was the yeah, was Attorney General Lyman Spitzer. Yeah, well, yeah. Elliot was a was a governor of New York. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, so Lyman Spitzer. Yeah. Yeah. So Lyman Spitzer Jr. lived from 1914 to 1997. He's an American. He was a theoretical physicist, an astronomer, and a mountaineer. <laughs> Somebody were the first to climb some peak, which I'd never heard of. I'm not sure where it is. Um, and he's credited on Wikipedia with being the first person to propose a telescope in space. Oh, I didn't know that. That makes sense too, then, of course. Of course, it is Wikipedia. So I, don't know. Yeah, I just <laughs> loved his textbook on inter the interstellar medium. I thought it was like the cleanest, clearest writing on how gas behaves between stars mm -hmm. uh, that I'd read. So. Well, thank you very much. I think that was outstanding. Well, thank you. Christmas is early for you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.